Thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, my name is Kenan Rooney. I'm going to be the facilitator uh, of our webinar today, the topic being on healthcare uh, risk as well as enterprise risk management. Just a, a couple of things, just for housekeeping. Uh, please submit any questions that you may have um, or comments via the chat feature, and I'll consolidate those questions during this um, webinar. And we are offering one CPE credit for this live session. So in order to be eligible for that, I, uh, you need to participate for the whole webcast and answer. We actually have four polling questions today. So answer at least two to three of those polling questions at, uh, during the intervals of this um, uh, webinar. Uh, once we, at the end of this, you'll be receiving your CPE certificates within two weeks in your email. And then there's also going to be a survey that's forwarded to, with to you after this webcast. All right. So thank you all for being here um, today. Uh, our today's presenters are Todd Gower. I'm not going to read you their bio. Todd Gower and Augustine Doe. Um, Todd will be pre presenting on the whole uh, risk com risk compliance, and he runs our risk management solutions for RGP. And Augustine runs our enterprise risk management practice within RGP. I'm going to let them introduce themselves when they're presenting. So I'm going to hand it over to Todd, who's going to talk us through the first part of this. And then Augustine will introduce himself and then talk through his section. All right, Todd. Great. Nice to see you, buddy. So thank you. As you can see on the uh, bio of, of who I am, uh, I obviously not wearing a suit and tie today for this making <laughs> casual. It's, and it's supposed to be informational for you as well. So both Augie and I, I've been working in this field for quite some time, so we look forward to having any questions related to this. And as Ken had mentioned, it is recorded, so uh, you can go back and look at what we stated. All right. Thank you, Ken. So, as, do you want me to talk about this one, or yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. So, I think from the, the take the key takeaways from this is looking at risk, both from enterprise side and also where you might have transformational needs, and thinking through what are, what is that journey, and it can be over it could be overwhelming. Uh, when you think about the over-encompassing needs of risk management from the first, second, third lines of defense, well, we can talk about that too later on if you'd like about the differentiations between the three. But our main focus today is around risk transformation and, and those elements that you might be considering in your overall program uh, or organization. Next slide. So the acronym game. So all of us have been, are in healthcare, especially uh, supply chain has to listen to what it is that compliance needs or operational risk folks need. Uh, but this is just a, a, a small list of acronyms that we currently come across with our clients and also talking through our organizations that need support on compliance and risk. And we think about the RAC, I was a RAC leader for, for Region A, 13 states in the Northeast. Uh, what, is, what is HRSA? Those are the areas you think about, why is health resources and service administration all about? And we think about DEA, of course, it's very popular, the shows about it, but it, you know, the reality of it compared to what we have to do in the other areas of compliance uh, is all balanced, I think. This is not as sexy. And then EMR, EHR, there's always that mix between what's being used as a health record and a medical record. And uh, this, of course, this presentation, so I can go into differentiations of this, but at least being comfortable with these acronyms to understand when they get uh, used uh, across the organization. Next slide. So our first polling question. Good, Dan. You guys, our first polling question is, you can see it if you can answer it on the screen. What does CMS stand for? So, excellent. Thank you all. Yes. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Thank you very much. Well, and the guys at CMS sometimes really can't make salads. They have to go buy them. Yes. So that's, that's okay. So we used to harass the guys at CMS. Um, but anyway, that's perfect. Thank you, Ken. Great. So when we think about what's, what's the need for risk transformation, and transformation can be overused, but risk is sometimes it's, it can be scary to think of, okay, if we put the risk register together of an organization, the normative risks or inherent risks that are there, it could be a Bible, as thick as a Bible or, or whatever your preferred religion. But regardless, so is it, what are the key areas of focus and what can be strategic and tactical? And that's where 
Augie and I will go through that process with you and talking through that. But what is strategic for organization? What do I need to get done on tactical? And making sure that we, if we're working in an organization, we don't have any sanctions or, or enforcements against us and fines. Some of my current clients are going through it right now. We thought they had a good compliance organization or a good risk organization because of COVID, this is very timely. Areas of concern related to, to risk are getting missed. And so what the Fed has been doing since they've been paying out all this money, especially to SBA loans, to hospitals and health systems to help them out, there's a need for them to come back and, they, and they're coming back hard right now. So in 2022, the end of this year will be a very, um, was, would be very, uh, very hard for folks. So anyway, thank you. Todd, real quick, I am curious about this and especially with this audience and some of the clients that you've been meeting and on some of the clients I've been meeting, can you share with this po you know, post-COVID or you know, pandemic yeah. towards the, what has been the focus in regards to some of this strat strategic focus that uh, you're, you're hearing that clients are focused on or i.e. another way of saying it is where they're focusing their funding on? Yeah, you know, a lot of them are thinking through what they're trying to grow as a business because there has been some stagnation in their business and they want to expand to new areas. And because of what COVID has done is actually diverted a lot of attention and resources to what be normally would be something that would be strategic. And they're finding themselves in a bit of a pickle, like, okay, what do we have to do as a result? We have to create a plan of action to make sure that if we're going to this new area of business, that we've got all of our T's and I's crossed and dotted respectively. And so with, with that, they, they know that if they go into this new area of business, they've got to get their programs in place. And we found that a lot of them, as well well intended, they may do a great job of their accreditations or maintaining the relationship with the DOI, Department of Insurance, or with their health uh, market leaders with the state, they, they fail in the areas of the overall risk program. And so they might, they might get themselves into a, a CIA, Corporate Integrity Agreement, or potential indictment because people are not watching what folks are doing in practicing medicine or giving care in the care of telemedicine and being diverted in counseling sessions. So this at the advent of COVID or the pandemic had created a new environment for pushing out telemedicine and remote learning and remote teaching and remote, especially on the healthcare side, and remote care. So I think that's where this is becoming uh, truly apparent to think about areas of risk. Now we're looking in a remote place, the remote areas of care, unlike we've ever seen before. And folks aren't coming back to work because they like doing work remotely. A lot of our consultants found this to be a great opportunity for them as they come out of being the industry uh, to help help their healthcare leaders out doing things remotely. I have folks that moved to Maine, and so they're helping folks out from Maine to people down in LA. And so it's, it's becoming a big mixed bag of care, of treatment. And actually some healthcare companies are going through the policies and procedures. They're going, can we now, since the emergency orders have now been uh, 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 closed out, if you will, or they've, they've ex expired, they are now forcing these companies to think about how they do practice medicine from one state to the other and what level of care can be provided. So the state boards are looking at how they give definition around that. So there's a lot of things that are happening as a result from this. So it's a good chance that if you don't do this well in 2022, there's gonna be a, 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 probably a, a more deeper dive in how people are caring for others across state lines, so. Todd, this is right on. I'm, I'm glad you said something. I was. I was thinking you would go towards the direction of telehealth and all this remote diagnostic yeah. work and remote monitoring and the, the mm -hmm. risk associated with all that, doing this in a remote fashion, not mm -hmm. only just our employees, but care, you know, patient care in a remote and how that impacts a risk organization, right? So yes, strategically organizations want to not grow their revenue, but grow and improve patient experience, improve quality, but at the same time doing this from a remote, remote uh, in a remote manner, when it, I just would think, you know, you talk about strategic risk would just be one of the top things, even cyber risk would even. That's be right. 
you, you have, the, the cool thing about this too is the thing about you go to your CVS or Walgreens and you have the drive up window. Strategically, Walgreens had to make sure, CVS, CVS had to make a, a strategic decision on how they want to dispense meds without people coming in or make it less uh, taxing for the individuals to come in, make it easy for them to pick their meds outside or even the COVID testing. Well, then the follow up means the follow up action happens like, well, there's HIPAA concerns about yelling out that person's medication on the loudspeaker in the uh, in the line where you're getting your tube of stuff and putting in or at the front window counter yelling out, you know, yes, I've got this condition. Yes, this is my protocol. And the and the pharmacist having to tell you what the procedure should be as you take it home with you. So the follow up medicine practice now though those rules have expired for a lot of pharmacists to cross state lines to give medication therapy management to individuals receiving the care, it becomes very cumbersome and, and uh, a risk to the organization that they're actually practicing out of scope of practice. So there's a lot of things to consider. And I know, you know, Augie being a, a, an attorney um, or a JD here for us can, can talk a little bit more about risk there. But yeah, there's, it's been really interesting to see our clients look at things a little differently as a result. Thank you. Yeah. So when you think about risk transformation services, these are just a bucket of things to consider. So if you're starting to think through in conversations with leaders about what does it mean about risk? Well, risk in general is just that, right? It's, it's a, an impact to the organization, but it would mean an adverse effect to the organization. So how do you protect yourself against that? There's various things you can do to logically break them apart. So it's not just talking about risk in general. So if an organization is looking at their risk maturity models, which you know Augie can go into uh, a two or three hour conversation on that just alone and compliance effectiveness, thinking through what do I need to be worried about on the various protocols prescribed by CMS or the state regulatory boards. And then the overall program effectiveness, thinking through how effective are your audit programs from internal audit and external and, and from uh, compliance audit. And reporting in technology. We just had this conversation this morning around you could be tooled up completely, but you still miss the boat because you're looking at your monitors. When I was an artillery officer, the one thing they taught us this is that, yes, the little tools are great, the GPS systems are great, but you still have to go back to the map and measure where the, land, the round's going to land to just double check because sometimes the technology be wrong. So you can't rely on your tools completely. Otherwise, you could have a mistake, a, a false positive, if you will. Right? And then you think about how, because how you look at your compliance organization or internal audit organization, how do you balance that out with resources? Because sometimes you can't hire from within because there aren't any resources there. So you have to have this blend, if you will, for special projects. So you can at least get your coverage and audits done. There's a way to do that, right? And then third-party risk management and pharmacy compliance are all unique based on provider or payer setting. Uh, thinking through either you're the one that's contracted as a physician with the, with the payer or with you as a health plan, looking at your contracts with providers or with other vendors, along with providers looking at their vendors too, but making sure you've got your vendor management risk clearly identified uh, on who you're dealing with. Either someone that could be on a disbarred list, which could be a huge challenge for you, that you're actually practicing with someone who's been disbarred, uh, or someone who, um, uh, is uh, has now been contacted in, by the DEA or DOD or DA, DOJ, I'm sorry, DOJ, uh, that's still operating and they shouldn't be, and you're still working with them. So just a matter of looking at your third parties that support you. And, uh, and lastly, on pharmacy, it all depends on what the setting is in, either other health plan side from a formulary to the, the hospital side or retail pharmacy side, looking at your risks there and pharmacy compliance. Go next page. So risk transformation maturity. So this is what we talked about earlier, one of the, of the circles. And how do you measure the role of risk in governance? So assessing your overall governance program, you know, it, it could be the result of a newly hired executive that's come on board. So we've had this conversation today. Someone's been there for five years. They still haven't done their overall big bang assessment of compliance. And what they need to do is provide an assessment to strategically look at their area of what they need to find as weak points or and also enhance their strength, their strong points so they can actually be more, uh, more of a shooter partner to their operation. 
And typically, the time frame around these assessments can be six to 12 weeks, depending on the size of the organization and the complexity of the maturity needed to review and read. Next page. Uh, talk to me a little bit about this risk transformation maturity yeah. um, in regards to how this, I, I would think right now would be the time that this reassessment would have to happen <laughs> um, because I'm wondering what's happened in the last two years. Yeah, you know, it has. And it's, as I mentioned earlier, we had one client that seemed to be doing really well with their program and enhancing on it from services they're providing to the clients in a care delivery setting. But what they didn't understand is that the, they had folks practicing care remotely and the dispensement of the, the treatment programs they had was not properly managed from the inventory standpoint. So there could be possible interactions with officials that would render them to close a business or potentially whoever whoever's diverting the uh, the the program the, the treatment program uh, could be put in jail as a result because it's highly regulated from a schedule two to a schedule three uh, drug. So you're thinking through those those maturity levels of why it's important to really assess that and understand that it gets back to understanding your business. And if you don't have a strategic plan, like a lot of companies will just say, hey, we just operate as a business and we have a checkoff list of saying, we've got compliance, we talked about that today, where it's more, it used to be more of an exercise of just, yep, we've got it, we've done our due diligence, but regulators or folks who are more seasoned in the space who are getting money from, I mean, we're giving money to you, uh, to that organization, could be a large group plan or what have you. They're looking. They're going to look at your organization and say, "Okay, what kind of compliance program do you actually have to make sure we're we're getting all the services and let's audit that." In, in one case, we had a federal program for a health plan. They found out they had nine thousand dollars of an invoice that was charged fully to the federal employees program. They should have been charged fifty percent, down to nine thousand dollars, and so they got a fine for that. Right. So it's like it's those little those little things that come up by going. How are you really tracking for that? You know, and you see, you have to really understand your area of risk and saying, well, is that, if that's that level, how mature do we need to be to make sure we can track that and capture that? That's where the fun starts. It's really assessing what are the nuances that need to be covered in risk management. And depending on whether it's regardless of the size of the organization, if you're getting any federal state funds, they will find a way to make sure they get their money back if you're doing it wrong so it's always good to have a little health check like you go to the doctor as much as it may pain you to sit there for 15 minutes you know it could be you know a one week exercise or two week exercise just to do a quick overview to see how your, your health is of your organization on compliance or you just do a quick one day session to see okay how do we want to go about this and it does take time to plan for it it really does because it's just not a checklist item because every every healthcare organization has their unique delivery model by be it a payer delivering membership and health benefits to a provider who's delivering care to a hospital to a hospital delivering care with their provider groups. So does that help, Kenan? Yep, that helped. Thank you. Um, everyone, I know there's some people that arrived late to the call. Please uh, put your questions in chat. Uh, I'm, I, I can facilitate them through Todd also and Avi when he speaks. Thank you. Todd, I, I, one, I, I know this just came across my mind. No, no. Um, let's talk about risk, risk transformation and the maturity model and going concerns of providers these days. Uh, yeah. I, 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 have you been working with clients? I mean, there's a lot of um, opportunities for integration, right? Acquisition, right? right? And, and then at the same time, we've been working, sadly, with some smaller facilities that I think have a going concern just because of what's happened in the last couple of years. Not, in, not any different than any other business, sadly, um, but outside of healthcare, right? Right. And so uh, what's some um, things that this audience or that they should be considering right now in regards to their risk maturity, other than stuff you just addressed, but anything that should be around going concern or? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's looking at your charter, right? Seeing, thinking through what is it that you're supposed to be doing? And it gets back to those base levels. And you look at your overall program, do you actually have an audit program? And you, know, you can have, you could probably miss an assessment two or three years or so, and then come in and do it. But, but do you actually have a program that's actually looking and asking questions 
aside from training, that's one thing you can track your training, but do you have a program that's going in and assessing your key areas of business, two or three areas of key, key areas of high risk that could potentially close you down or stop you from getting any new members or taking in new patients, just treating what you have. And it's really getting down to that. Like, what are you doing to make sure that you're protecting yourself to understand if your business is treating individuals with certain conditions and that's all it is is an outpatient clinic or to a major hospital system that has several different lines of services to you know, a payer who has different membership in different programs, be it small group or individual or commercial, uh, regardless of Medicare or Medicaid, uh, having the right checks and balances in to review how those interactions are happening with, with those, with their members. It could be the marketing program, enrollment, disenrollment. It could be how they're taking appeals or grievances along with physicians who are not actually operating uh, within the scope of practice because of COVID. You've got pediatric care doctors working in the ER for COVID for adult medicine. It's, it's, you're seeing a lot of this happening where just, they're just trying to find people to take care of people right now. So it's a, it's a good chance to have a gut check to set back and reassess where do we have the biggest risk uh, and make sure we're getting those gaps uh, filled or at least a mitigating plan to get there. Thank you. Welcome. This gets back into a program effectiveness. So once you've done your maturity and thinking through how am I doing, what exactly do you actually have as a, as a compliance organization, a program organization that's looking at how they're practicing compliance or risk? This could be a new chief compliance officer, CCO, or chief audit executive, a CAE, who's, who's new to the organization or first time leader or part of the annual process or you know, just transferred in. And all those things can happen and making sure that, okay, like a, we were talking about earlier, there are these seven elements that, that are very key to an organization. So we, we can go into an, another topic or conversation later on uh, for another webinar, if you like, what that all means. But understanding that there are certain prescribed protocols that CMS has has given everybody, so it's very easy to follow. Now there always there is some gray area, like how it gets done. But it's, again, it's at the same point. Do you have these things in place? Do you have an audit program in place? Do you have a chief compliance officer? Do you provide assessments? Do you have a monitoring and auditing program? Do you follow up? And so even that gets back down to the data of what gets transferred to CMS when they ask for the data, how timely is it? How accurate is it? Especially on calling back to members and patients on, on certain protocols. So the CMS, knowing that it can't send out auditors all the time, they're gonna look at data and making sure your organization is prepared and effective. There are ways to look at that with a program effectiveness review, aside from maturity review, but more, more importantly is how the efficacy of your program is, is gonna be key. Go to the next page. So we talked about third-party risk. So we think about the general assessment to automated reporting and monitoring that, just as I mentioned about auditing for maturity, now you look at your effectiveness of your program, and you, know, you say you've got a mature program, how effective is it? Then you dig deep into another area like, you know what, our vendors, we haven't checked their business associate agreement, has it been updated? Or we may have vendors that don't have a business, business associate agreement and they need to get one because they're out touching uh, healthcare and patient data or vendor or uh, uh, personal identifiable information. So um, you have a number of things to think through, especially around, like what Kenny mentioned earlier, around cyber risk. IT has been a really big pusher of this on third party risk because of the need for third parties to support IT that will touch the IT system that may touch member or patient data, and they may be onshore, offshore, or nearshore, be it Canada or, or in the uh, South America or uh, um, the South part of North America. So you have all those things that exist aside from are they practicing what they're doing or, or looking at the rates they're charging you know, based on most of your nation clauses, if you're a 501c3, make sure the organization is providing that to you and testing that. So when you think about third-party risk, there's a lot of things to consider and look at when you look at your controls that you need to monitor for your vendors, uh, be it a 
contracted entity from a health plan to a provider or a provider to a health plan or a hospital to a group of providers or specialty in support of ambulatory care or ambulances, just that, that delivery piece, where a lot of fraud has happened in the past is fake invoices, or they really haven't provided the care supposed to they have a lot of they have a lot of grievances against them and they have not rectified or made made good on the, um, the findings of that organization. So third party risk management has a broader view than just by name itself. There is a, a need to make sure that's done, at least on an annual basis, to assess how your vendors are performing. And it's just good hygiene. It just really is. It's not, not, not doing an inventory is a survey. It's actually looking at the contract, looking at the invoices, assessing who they really are, and making sure, too, the vendor master in your AP is set up properly so that oh my gosh, is it my cousin who's actually working with us? I, I, I've got a conflict here. There's all those things to consider in third-party risk management. I don't know if you have any questions on that one, um, Kevin. Okay. So when we think about uh, a compliance framework and we, we talk about risk in general, but when we get down into compliance as that second line of defense, you know, how does that framework look? And what we mentioned earlier about effectiveness, efficacy, or the maturity organization, these are the elements and things to consider to look at that. From the compliance function itself, what the, what the technology is to monitor from info, infotech, InfoSec, or decision support reporting out on areas of breaches to process of PMPs, incident response, one thing that really trips up a lot of organization is that incident response issue. Making sure it's properly categorized, properly followed up on, and that's not missed so you don't have a whistleblower. That's where we've seen a lot of, we're seeing a lot of this lately, where companies are just tired, they're not following up on the incidences, employees are getting tired, they're seeing problems, they're raising it up to executives, but executives are tired too, and they're missing the responsiveness that needs to happen from their organizations to look at incidents and it now has cost everybody a lot more time, just like that that uh, that ounce of preven uh, prevention is a, you know, versus a, a pound of cure. You know, it's that little thing that you want to do periodically of of checking and assessing your organization and doing a pulse check on your on your people. So that's where this framework that we use and I've used in the past uh, is helpful in explaining this to compliance officers. It's not just having a compliance program with a checklist and audit. All these things that are going to be considered in the overall program, especially to the top. We have a, when I was working and living in Latin America, we had a saying, "The fish stinks from the head," and so it's it is that 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 conversation point where you're looking at the tone of the top. What's the tone of compliance of risk? Is there are the risk lead, are the leadership looking at risk proactively and then supporting the risk leaders to make sure they're actually communicating? Hey, we've got some key issues or concerns. To make sure our code of conduct is not not being jeopardized, or that our strategies are, are are being jeopardized because we're not monitoring risk. So that's where this all kind of plays into graphically to have the conversation with compliance leaders. I'll pause there if there's any questions. Great. Next. Only question number two. We'll set this off. Um, Who helps in third-party risk management? IT, compliance, operations, all of the above? I forgot there was a fourth, there's a fifth one's like um, your parents, right? So, yeah, yeah. But. yeah. There we go, yes. <laughs> all of the above, thank you. Good. Okay. Todd, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, and again, if you guys have any questions for Todd, let us know. We are at the um, bottom of the hour. We're gonna go ahead and start with um, Augustine. Augustine, if you again could give your background or your introduction of yourself, then we'll move forward with the slide. Thank you, Todd. At that, thank you, Todd, and thank you, Kenny. Uh, this, this has been very good. And it's a good segue into what we do as far as uh, strategic enterprise risk management. Uh, I'm the enterprise uh, risk management lead at uh, RGP. What that entails is uh, 
helping companies really take a look at their strategies and deducing from those strategies the challenges or opportunities that you know come associated with those uh, strategies that they formulated and how to really navigate them or exploit the opportunities to continuously perform better. So next slide, please. Now this slide, the, the purpose of uh, sharing this slide uh, with you guys to, uh, and uh, everyone today is to give you a picture of what's going on, what the current state is, and what I would like you guys to start thinking through as you, you go back to your organizations so that uh, you become really more productive members of your team. Now, what you see there is that over the past decade, decade, we've been spending a lot of time on achieving the operating legal compliance, financial reporting rest. We've been doing a phenomenal job at managing those, which is really, really important. We call those table stakes risk that you need to really, as a base, must tackle first. Now, what we've also noticed is that while those are really important risks to be managing, you know, organizations need to start thinking about, okay, what are the risks that if we really do a good job at managing will really lead to us achieving our patient safety goals, uh, accreditation goals that we have, our revenue goals that we have, our human capital development goals that we have. So, and looking at those risks, uh, it is clear that strategic risks are the risks that when you really spend a lot of time managing, you are able to achieve those goals that you've set for yourself or the objectives of the organization. So we, what we're thinking of, you know, when we think of you guys uh, taking a look at risk, we want you to start changing your mindset to doing all the operating, the legal compliance and the financial reporting piece and shifting your focus more towards now the strategic components of risk. Now, I'll pass right there if you get if there's any questions that you know, come to mind on this particular slide. Nothing. On, no. Nothing. So we're going to move to the next slide. Oh, just a quick polling question, everybody. Polling question three. In the past decade, what type of risk caused organizations the most loss in market value? Financial reporting risk, operating risk, strategic risk, or legal and compliance risk. Mixed bag here, Augie of answers. <laughs> um, uh, strategic that's risk, right? That's to be expected. Uh, yes. In fact, that, that, that's the, the reason we are having this type of conversation today because what's going on is uh, we, we're learning a lot more about operating risk. We're learning a lot more about uh, uh, financial reporting risk. And those are front and center every day of every conversation that uh, is in, in our environment. However, we need to take a step back and look at what research is telling us. And the research is telling us that if you really want to move your needle or you want to achieve those organizational objectives that you have set for yourself, your patient safety goals, uh, your revenue goals, what you majority of uh, uh, risk you need to focus on is the strategic risk. And the strategic risks are those risks that are going to prevent you from achieving your strategic objectives or goals. So we can, you know, operating risks are good. It's kind, of, it's kind of like flossing. It's a good hygiene to have. But if you really want a strong teeth, you still have to do the fundamentals of making sure you're getting the right calcium in your body to let you have the strong enough teeth before you can floss. So let's move to the next slide, please. So now how do you get to, you know, have strategic risk be your focus and how does it help you really achieve the goal of organization? Here is what you, you need to start thinking about. Now with strategic risk, when you are able to manage them more effectively, 
you start seeing uh, you know the, the the environment where you are getting better traction with whatever you're you're trying to achieve you can you know you can also improve performance and how do you do that well one of the ways that strategic risk really has helped you know achieve your goals is it increases your the probability of you know of achieving your goals how does it do that it helps you come to terms with the reality of your both your internal and external environment. Now you know what the challenges are in that environment, even as you formulate your strategy. So you're able to formulate better strategies that really, when you go to execute, becomes easier for you to execute because you're really aware of the resource capabilities that you need to get those objectives achieved. The other way it helps the organization get better execution traction is it allows the management to talk a lot more about what are some of the fundamental challenges they are experiencing. And that conversation allows for easier solutions of how to get around those challenges to execute better. And then the third component is really when you start thinking about strategy and really making sure you're executing through your strategic risk, it narrows your focus to those things that are essential or critical for you to really achieve goals. And therefore, it leads to more efficient or optimal financial performance where you're not trying to boil the ocean. You're more focused on here is my strategy. What are the things I need to do to achieve those strategic objectives and goals? And fourthly, while you're looking at you know, uh, achieving those, those goals, it also really narrows your, your focus on even the compliance part. What are the key compliance items that I need to focus on for each strategy? And so that narrowed focus allows you to not just go on a shopping spree where you're buying all the EGRC systems out there or you're spending money on all the Medicaid tools out there, but your, your focus, your, your spend becomes more tailored to what your strategy demands you to, you know, to, so you really are focused on the, those right compliance uh, uh, items that would really get you where you need to go. And so if you need HIPAA uh, and the aspect of HIPAA that you're not doing so well on, it focuses your attention on that. So your resources are really optimally spent and therefore you end up really meeting regulatory compliance unique to that particular strategy that you're trying to uh, achieve or get you. And same thing here with uh, your, your information security, really, because it allows you to really continuously to be more focused and look at every strategy. What is the security? What are the security needs of executing that strategy? So it, it's a really very, I call it, it's a very right fit way for you to run your business where it, you don't stretch yourself to do everything that needs to be done in your industry, but you only do it from the standpoint of your specific unique strategies. What are the core things you need to do to get your strategies achieved? Let's go to the next slide, please. Actually, before, before you go on the next one though, um, Hayagi, you know, one, one of the cool things that you know, when you and I work together on this stuff, what, are, what have been some of the pitfalls and challenges you've seen from leaders that you know, just don't think about their road for navigating risk the way you've outlined here. So just some problems and challenges you've seen where there's, there's this is the right way to do it, but give us an example. Like, you know what, they should have done it and they didn't do it. And because uh, you've, you've crossed a number of industries in your career and just curious about uh, for this team here, your thoughts around that. So I thought, excellent, excellent question. Yeah. One, of the, one of the key things that we see all the time is the ability, the taking on of too much in very short time. Strategic risk should be approached from the standpoint of looking at your strategic objectives and coming up with the challenges unique to your strategy, not the entire industry's uh, challenges. You know, so when, when we begin conversation with leaders, what we normally find and routinely find is the focus on cyber, the focus on all the risks specific to their industry. 
However, when you look at the strategy or objectives that they are trying to achieve, we want them to start thinking about what are the components of cyber that are really intimately involved with your specific strategy so that you're not trying to boil the ocean and become so overwhelmed with trying to solve every risk as in your industry. So that's been a big, big thing that we've observed over time. That once you're able to do this assessment or narrower focus, you feel more confident and feel more relaxed that I am only focusing on those items that are unique to us, to what we're trying to achieve in Medicare, to unique to what we are trying to do in terms of growing our revenue. And therefore it becomes a lot more manageable and you are not overwhelmed. Um, actually, I'm going to ask the participants if you can, I know that when you respond to the chat, um, you all won't see the answers in the chat, but I'm actually going to ask you to put an answer to this in the chat. And I'm going to ask the question to you, Augustine, as well as um, Todd. In regards to enterprise risk, I can't help but to think that as an organization, that you would have to almost relook at what's happened in COVID in the last two years yeah. and re-diagnose enterprise risk as things like, and I'm going to say, um, and just flatly, I know some of our healthcare, some of our healthcare organizations are requiring their employees to be, uh, to have the vaccine. And if they're not vaccinated, they're going to lose uh, employees. They're going to have to transition out of the organization. I would think that would be an enterprise risk in general. Yeah. I mean, so but my question is, if you, all of you on the participants, if you could put in the chat some of those right now uh, thoughts that you think would be driving the relook at enterprise risk of your organization from cyber to things that your organization, that would be great. I'll share them with everybody as you type into the chat. But Todd and, and Augie, I'm going to stop talking and see if you guys have a case. Yeah, yeah. no, no. I, I, I think let me touch on this real quick where, you know, and Augie definitely knows this as an enterprise piece, but one of the things that's so funny when we're doing ERM, and having a risk leader like Augie come in and we, and before you had this little section about black swan events and black swan events are those things like a pandemic or an earthquake, things like that are just not really planned. You kind of plan for them, but you can't because you're, it'd be too expensive to always plan for them. Well, the pandemic happened and people thought even with large life science companies, this will pass in three months and we'll go back to normal. No, it's been like a year and a half to two years now. So folks are really have to rethink their overall ERM program and have folks like us come in to think that through. It was like, I mean, let's think to those areas that you thought were black swan events. They're coming to life, meaning that if you have a pandemic, you might lose some people from the death of themselves or the fact that, you know what, it's not so much death. People just don't want to work for you because you're forcing a mandating a vaccine. You know, because it's federal mandated or state or, or local mandated, um, those things happen. So now you've got a labor force that's clearly impacted as a result. You got people going to be out of work. You got monies that were supposed to go to that business now no longer have that business. So you have, as this is, it is a, it's a, it's, it's macroeconomics on a scale that we've never seen before. And you also have issues with supply chain. That's impacting life sciences and medical device companies of getting products and services from different parts of the world and global as a as a piece and part something that's unique for their medical device. Now they can't come over because they're locked in Hong Kong somewhere or Shanghai. I've got clients where I'm on, on a board of a couple of companies where we're seeing that we can't get product or information uh, when things will be delivered uh, like we used to have all those things on top of this, too. On the financial side, just thinking this through, it's not so much of, okay, you pass the regulatory requirement. Well, you got to have the regu regulatory issues that are impacting financing. When you think about the financing piece, it's more around, oh my gosh, there used to be a predictive model of your revenue coming in and your AR was X. Well, because of the pandemic, the AR is now slowed down significantly. Days on days of getting cash, cash collections, it's completely slowed down. So those revenue models are also being impacted for potentially accruing revenue that was on a cyclical basis that could be counted on and that had, that, that had consistency to them and pass the muster of, of controls for consistency. So all those things, those nits and nats that are coming into play, all because of COVID, 
now have exacerbated every line of risk area that could be impacted. So it's not just, oh, everyone gets sick and they can't go to work. Well, no, it's, it's a whole macro piece of a business. That's where ERM is going to be really crucial. And, and to add to Todd's point, yeah. you know, our, our, our former president, Dwight Eisenhower, said it best. Plans are useless, but planning is everything. What that means is that while, you know, things don't happen the way we plan for them, and, you know, you, you shouldn't spend your time trying to figure out all the black swans and, you know, uh, be ready for that. If, but if you spend the time to do the planning, what it does for you is it allows you to become nimble, resilient, so that when things do happen, you have the capability to pivot. And companies that have had the opportunity to really take a look at their business models and understand their supply chain, understand their human capital needs, and have gone through a little bit of planning, they are outperforming companies that didn't do that. I was at a recent uh, uh, Emerald City uh, event where we, in Seattle, where we spent time to understand what's going on with the supply chain, to understand what's going on with CISOs and what some of the pandemic challenges. And one thing that came out of that is that planning had helped them become really nimble where they can quickly pivot to things that could help them really address any changes that are happening. Now, it, it's a lot more ad hoc, but it still allowed them to get solutions for each challenge, the human capital, like the great resignation. There are a variety of ways that CISOs and supply chain managers uh, put together solutions to address those in really very record time. And those companies that did the planning and went through that are not are very intimate with the ability to pivot and have been very, very successful at pivoting and doing very well. And thank you, Joni, uh, for adding in workforce capacity, burnout, right? It's some of the oh, risks yeah. that's going on too. So thanks for putting Huge. that in the chat. Yeah. Huge. I mean, the thing about recruiting too, so for recruiters and you know, having one of my family members being an exec recruiter for a large hospital system, docs or director chairs, uh, heads of nursing for units, they're, they're burnt out. And now how do you find a skilled individual like that out of the air? You can't. It's, that's, a, that's a highly trained individual that's now out and that's now going to impact care because now you've got, again, as I witnessed this too, visiting ERs and assessing this, you got people who are, are clearly licensed to practice medicine, but put in situations where they haven't dealt with that on a recurring basis, now putting people at risk. And it's, and it's becoming a problem. You know, health plans a little different because you have uh, you know, membership bases, but then you have people who are fatigued by dealing with all the appeals and grievances from the members. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a catch 22. You know, you wanna help everybody, but you can't. And, and then if you wanna have remote learning, or I'm sorry, remote working, but then bring them back in the office, they don't wanna work now. So it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's unprecedented because of what the delays have been getting getting this under under control so thank you and, and and just to be clear too you know rgp does not have a political opinion on this we're not we're not saying that mandates are bad or anything else like that we're just saying that this is the reality we're hearing and seeing from our, mm -hmm. our clients so yeah thank you for clarifying that Todd. yes you're welcome you're welcome so um our next polling question our last polling question um is in the past decade how much time did organizations spend on managing strategic risk? So we talked about strategic risk being one of the opportunities. How much time did an organization spend on managing strategic risk? And how come I can't vote? <laughs> so actually the answer is 6%. I, I try to back up to that slide, but it is not much time, No, right? Sadly. That organizations are spent aren't or aren't <laughs> spending on this um, on this issue about this. Right? Well, I mean, just you and I were just talking about this today with yeah. with other clients, and they go, "Oh, let's work about it till the end of the next year." Like, wait, hold on a second. Yeah, you can't you can't just delay this. Yeah, yeah. Just to clarify, Todd and I were on a meeting earlier, and one of our clients was talking about 
they're looking at and that's that's wait till next year to talk about the enterprise risk and rescoping. It's like, oh, okay, I guess we want to wait till next year. It was just an interesting conversation. Sorry, Linda, uh, you can vote. Uh, apologize. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll count you as accurate. Yeah, we'll count. Yeah, thank you. Well, and then one of the reasons for that is what it's this ne next slide is uh, going to walk us through, where we need to start thinking about things in a really very different context. That we do have compliance, legal financial reporting risk, those are critical things that we need to be managing on a day-to-day -day basis. At the same time, we need to also be looking at the strategic objectives that we're trying to achieve and the strategic goals. And the good way to do that is to follow these steps that we outlined here. These would really bring you to terms with your execution realities. What are the things that based on your individual strategy or objectives, what are the things that I need to be doing as an organization to be able to achieve those strategic goals or objectives that we have set for ourselves? You know, and it starts with these steps. Now, depending on where you are in terms of your mature, the maturity of your program, you can start from the fifth step or you can start from the fourth step. So it's really, it depends on you, the individual organization where they are. But in the end, you need a lot of the things that talk, talk, talk to you as about earlier on. You need to be doing an assessment. You need to be benchmarking what you're doing to leading practices. You need to have some sort of a, a, a program or software that gives you a real good sense of how well you're doing, or how well your efforts are actually getting the traction that's needed to, for you to achieve those goals. And those things need to be happening continuously. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about this too, I mean, Augie's a competitive runner, so he likes doing steps. That's why he likes doing this slide. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, you, got, you, got, you got to take your time to this process. I mean, what Augie and I see with our clients, it's, it's amazing. They just want to get to seven right away. Like, well, you're not going to do that. You can't jump from one to to seven. Yeah, you, know? you just can't. So, so, I mean, you could, but you got to be really in good shape to do that. To, to do that. So, so these, so these are the some of the things that we think that when you start doing and start focusing on, you can start addressing your strategic risk a lot more clearly, and which would help you really improve your performance, and you will be able to reach your your patient safety goals, that's you know, your cybersecurity goals. Uh, you can grow your revenue the way you want to grow your, you can get the members that you want to be part of your, uh, your, your network. So all of a sudden you're looking at the big pieces of your, uh, of your organization and you are moving them in the direction that helps you achieve your goals. Right, and the last thing to mention too is that there's a lot of information out there on, on, on the internet or interweb as that uh, movie goes. But you see a lot of that and that can help you through this process. But really, if you want to right size and understand it better, it is, it is recommended to find some professionals like us who are certified in the space to look at risk either from IT or from the clinical side or from whatever to think it through because you could misdiagnose yourself or, or misthink of where you are in your maturity or where you are in your area, and then you get yourself in a bit of a bind if you do get audited, thinking that you have it. So I, I just I think it's really important as you're going through your organization, thinking strategically, it does help to think it through with, with some professionals that understand risk and to, to waylay any fears you might think is a high risk area, and quite frankly, may not be as high as other areas you thought were low. So just it's just thinking through that process, and it's always helpful to have professionals thinking it through with you. We are five minutes before the top of the hour, and um, I haven't seen any really questions coming through the chat. If there's anybody has any questions, please ask them now. Or the other part of it is there's Todd and Augie's email there, right? Or if you have any questions, you can send it to our general mailbox, partner at rgphealthcare.com, okay? So um, any questions? Well, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Todd and Augustine, for your time and uh, efforts on this. And everybody have a great rest of your week. Take care. Recording. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.